Hello class, I am Joella Riley. I'll be your instructor for Introduction to Speech Communication, where you'll be learning um, what makes an effective uh, public uh, speech. So today we'll get started with chapter one. Sorry about that. So what I wanna go over, uh, we have the different course objectives uh, that show in the syllabus as well as the overview. Um, but I want to also focus on some very important main objectives or outcomes for this course. So I want you all to come out of this course feeling a lot more comfortable just with the idea of public speaking. I know for me, when I was a freshman, just thinking about having to get up in front of my class, which it was a small college as well, or university. Um, and even then, just that anxiety of feeling, um, you know, am I gonna mess up? Am I gonna stutter? What, you know, am I gonna lose my train of thought? So I just want y'all to feel a lot more comfortable after this class, anytime that you have to do any type of public speaking. Um, of course, also coming out with a very much more effective level of public speaking. Once you understand the basics and what makes a really good uh, speech, then you'll have a lot more confidence in yourself and you'll have you know, a really good level of understanding of public speaking. And at the same time, hopefully we can have some type of fun in the process of um, completing this course. So chapter one, it goes into just speaking in public, a very general uh, overview. So public speaking is not anything new. Uh, this has been the most vital means of communication throughout history. Aristotle's rhetoric composed during the third century BC is still considered today one of the most important works um, on the subject of public speaking. And many of the principles that we currently follow, speakers and writers today, um, are based on his rhetoric. The oldest known handbook of effective speech was written on papyrus in Egypt some 4,500 years ago. So what does this mean? That means that since way back when, ages, people before us have had to deal with, you know, learning how to be an effective orator or public speaker and have also dealt with, you know, the anxiety of public speaking that we still have today. So chapter one, what I want us to do is kind of stop thinking so much about speaking in public. Um, I want you to think more of any time, whether you're in a small group or a larger group, that public speaking is more of just making your ideas public. What it is that you have to share with other people um, and influencing them in the same process. So don't think of it so much of, I'm going to have to be in front of people and speaking in public, but more of, hey, I have something that I want to share that's important to me or I feel that's uh, important for others to know. And at the same time, you're going to be influencing people. That's really what public speaking is, sharing your ideas with other people. Um, also, it's very important that you learn the skills of public speaking because you will be needing these skills at some point in your life. Not only right now as a college student, um, having to present um, speeches in front of you know, all your classes, but in your personal life, in your professional life, you're gonna have to understand those skills because you'll be using them, whether it's at work, um, you know, doing an interview, that's kind of public speaking. You are selling yourself, telling these people why they should hire you or whether it's asking for a promotion, you know, you're selling, you're persuading them why you should get a promotion. And you also use persuasion skills and informative skills in your personal life, whether it's having kind of a discussion or a debate with peers, with friends, with family. So there's lots of different scenarios that you'll be able to see these um, examples in your chapter one of your book, page four. So kind of going back into the importance of why you need public skill, uh, public speaking skills. So employers seek applicants with the ability to verbally communicate 
with people both inside and outside of the organization. It's a skill that they really, really are looking for in their employees or future employees. It's reported that this is the one skill that is way more important and harder to find in people nowadays, um, which is effective communication. Some businesses are actually starting to have people do uh, speeches early in their career. So it's important that once you graduate, you already have these skills uh, because you might start doing speeches right away. Also, some college graduates are being asked to give a presentation as part of their job interviews once you're going in. Um, usually as a student, you are, your whole time is consumed by classes. So you don't really have much experience in what your major is when you graduate. So it's really important that you have these skills of um, interviewing and speaking because that's going to be one of those things that's going to make you um, be set apart from the others who are applying for that job. So businesses say that it's rare to find somebody who has a combination of both highly technical skills, so you know, really tech savvy, and at the same time have really good verbal communication because of this age that we're in with Instagram and Twitter, uh, they've seen that lots of people are losing that ability to talk in a professional way. It's also important for this skill because no matter what your major is or what you plan on doing uh, as far as career-wise, they're looking for this skill all across the board. So whether you're going for accounting, architect, teachers, technicians, scientists, stock brokers, they are wanting somebody who has very highly effective communication skills. So really they are ranking it um, higher than even technical knowledge when they're deciding who they're gonna be hiring or promoting. So uh, going back to your mindset and how you see public speaking, um, just really think of it as you know, you're having a conversation. It might not be with one person, might be with a small group, or it might be with a large group, but that's really what you're doing is having a conversation. And public speaking has uh, similarities to when you are having a conversation with somebody. First of all, the similarities are you organize your thoughts logically in both of them. So when you're talking with a friend, um, you know, say you're giving them directions, you're not gonna start with the end first, you're gonna give them directions of step one, step two, step three. So when you're doing a speech, that's the same thing. You might have a specific topic, but you're gonna have subtopics that you're gonna to want to logically organize those. That way it's easier and more effective for your audience to understand. The second similarity, similarity in conversations and public speaking is you tailor your message to your audience. So what that means is depending on who you're speaking to, you might adjust the way that you deliver your speech or your conversation. So say you are um, describing what your major is to some friends. You would you know, be able to give them uh, a vocabulary that they'd be able to understand, but unless they're specific to your major, they might not understand all the technical jargon. Now let's say your 10 year old cousin asks what your major is, then you probably give a completely different explanation to your cousin than what you did to your adult friends. So same thing with your um, speeches, depending on who your audience is, you're gonna have to adjust your words, adjust your style of delivery. Um, so that's the same similarity, similarity you have in conversation and public speaking. You tailor your speech depending on who um, is gonna be listening or who you're giving it to. Thirdly is you tell your story for a uh, maximum effect. So let's say you're saying a joke or this really um, you know, interesting story of something that happened to you. So when you're having a conversation, you don't normally start with the punchline or the end, but you actually kind of build up towards it to have that maximum effect. Same thing with public speaking, you're gonna build on your speech or on your topic to really um, get your audience hooked at the beginning and hooked at the end. And then you adopt to listener feedback. Normally that's gonna be nonverbal. So what that means is whether you're talking to a friend or you're doing your speech, you can tell these gestures if somebody looks confused 
or if they're nodding and leaning towards you, that means they're interested or they agree with you. So you change your speech um, as you see this nonverbal feedback you're able to adopt. So say you are speaking with a friend and you see that they're confused, then you might say, um, you know, do you have a question or, you know, you might go on to explain a little bit more. Same thing with public speaking. If you see people are confused or they're yawning, you might try to adopt your speech a little bit to, you know, hook them back into your speech. So there's different scenarios of this in your book on page seven. Now with conversation and public speaking, there are three ways that they are different. First of all, public speaking is a lot more structured. What that means is unlike a normal conversation um, that you might you know, not be in a rush on uh, with public speaking, usually it is very time limited. You know, you're gonna have a certain allotment. You have to be really prepared because you know, I only have 10 minutes to persuade or inform on this topic. So it's a lot more preparation and research that you have to do and have everything polished for your speech. Then it requires more formal language. So obviously you wouldn't be using slang or jargon in a uh, public speaking setting versus a conversation. So same thing, a lot more polished. You're making sure that the words um, and verbiage you're using are a higher standard and the method of delivery is different. Your conversation is a lot more informal versus your public speaking delivery. You're going to be staying away from fillers like, um, you know, um, and your posture is going to be a lot more professional as well. So these are the three ways that conversation and public speaking are different. So let's go on to stage fright. When asked uh, to name their greatest fear, the majority of people always say public speaking as one of the top um, fears. We've all experienced some level of nervousness when it comes to public speaking. Um, and even some of the greatest speakers suffered from stage fright. Abraham Lincoln, Margaret Sanger, and even Winston Churchill all uh, explained that they had this anxiety, they had stage fright, whenever they would have to go up and speak. Uh, nowadays, even celebrities have to explain the same. Jennifer Lawrence, Conan O'Brien, Oprah Winfrey, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, just to name a few, also have stage fright that they've admitted. And myself as well, as a freshman, uh, I also had stage fright, um, you know, where you either rush to do your speech, you can't really control your speed, so you're kind of talking real fast, um, you know, you feel like everybody's eyes are on you. You forget where you're at uh, in, in your speech. So that happens to everybody. So what are some ways to try to control that anxiety and actually make it work for you? So one of the main things and more important things is getting more experience, just like any type of skill, whether it's uh, learning to play an instrument or you know riding the bicycle the more that you practice the better and more effective that you're going to get um, on that skill and at the same time you're going to be a lot more comfortable more confident in doing it um, and not be so you know, anxious prepare uh, cannot emphasize that as much or enough better said so the more that you prepare the more that you research your topic, the more that you practice your speech, then you're gonna feel a lot more confident because you've prepared. Normally, when you're very um, anxious about public speaking, it's because you waited last minute, you didn't really know your topic too well. Um, so if you really know your topic by heart um, and you practice it, then normally it really isn't anything to be um, nervous about. Also, you wanna think positive thoughts. So it's human nature, you know, we're just thinking of worst case scenario of going up there and doing your speech. But you want to counteract those thoughts and think positive thoughts. So psychologists actually say there's a five to one ratio. For each negative thought that you have, you should counter with at least five positive thoughts. 
and that will help keep your um, anxiety under control. So let's say you think, oh, you know, I'm probably going to forget and, you know, forget where I'm, what I'm going to say next. Then you have to automatically just counteract that and say, no, I've practiced this enough. Um, I feel confident. I'm going to do really great. I'm going to get a good grade. So just counteract those negative thoughts with positive thoughts. Then there's also power in visualization. So that is like a vivid blueprint that you create in your mind where you actually see yourself. So it's like a movie. Um, you see yourself going up there, doing your speech, knowing, you know, all your sub points really well, um, you know, knowing all the answers to the questions you might get and just seeing everything going very successful. The more that you visualize that, the more comfortable that you'll be when it's actually time to do your speech. Um, so it's playing that whole scenario in your head, seeing everything go very smoothly. And then keep in mind that most nervousness is not visible. So when you go up there, you might think that people can tell you're nervous, but they actually can't. They can't see uh, your heart, you know, beating a hundred, um, you know, times per second. They can't see your, you know, clammy hands. Um, so just feel more comfortable knowing that you might be really nervous, but at least most people can't tell. I don't know if you've ever had you know, to do a presentation where um, you sit down after you present and you tell a friend like, oh my goodness, I was so nervous. Normally they'll say, really? I couldn't even tell because they can't. So, um, so don't focus so much when you're up there and you're feeling nervous. At least know that's one thing you can check off about why to be nervous. Um, they can't tell that you are nervous. And don't expect perfection. Not everybody is gonna have a perfect speech. Sometimes there is no such thing as a perfect speech. Some of the greatest speeches that we know, there's actually some errors. Um, so the I have a dream speech, uh, he actually stumbled on some of his words, but nobody remembers that. They only remember how great of a speech it was because he was very confident in his speech he didn't um, focus on those stumbles. He just kept on going through. So that's what you have to uh, focus on as well. If you are passionate about your message, people are gonna be focused and hanging on to what your message is, um, not about you know, some errors that might um, happen. And lastly, think about your speech, not so much as a performance. You're not an actor, uh, you're not a dancer, so you're not up there to perform but you're up there to communicate. So as long as you're able to communicate on a topic effect effectively that you feel strongly about, then that's what the audience is gonna be doing. They're just gonna be holding on and focusing on your message and are gonna focus on what you have to say. So let's move on to critical thinking. Critical thinking is a focused, organized way of thinking um, that's more logical. You're thinking about the logical relationships among ideas. So it's looking at the evidence. How sound is the evidence that they're providing? It's really the difference between fact and opinion. So if somebody is giving you an opinion of how they feel about something or what they think about something, then that's not really based on critical thinking. Now, if somebody tells you, I believe X, Y, and Z because of fact A, fact B, fact C, then that's where you're going to be using your critical thinking skills. What is it logical? Is there really evidence behind what they're using to support their, um, their argument? So it's a matter of logic, being able to spot weaknesses in other people's arguments and also to avoid them in your own. It's very important to have critical thinking skills because people are gonna be listening to your arguments as well, and you're gonna be listening to other people's arguments. Um, so have you ever been in an argument or a debate or heard one where their argument just was not backed up logically? So it's kind of hard to be persuaded or informed when somebody just doesn't have a very logical argument. So if your speech structure is clear and co cohesive, that means your thinking is as well. 
organizing your speech is very important in arranging and shaping the ideas themselves. As you learn to listen critically to speeches, that's going to help you better assess the ideas of many speakers in different situations. Um, you know, if you're listening to a campaign, I know right now there's a lot of political debates going back and forth, and it's hard to believe or know well, what's true, what's not, and this is where it's important. You're thinking, what are, you know, using your critical thinking skills, what's fact, and researching that to be able to then make a decision of, you know, which campaign or which side. Um, also when, you know, advertising, persuasion, things like that, where people are trying to get you to donate or get you to follow something, you use your critical thinking skills. Should I, do I agree with this? Yes or no, based on the supporting arguments or opposing arguments. So what is the actual speech communication process? You have the speaker, that's a person who is presenting the actual message to the listener. You have the message, so that's whatever it is that uh, the topic or that the speaker is trying to communicate with someone else. Your goal in public speaking is to have your intended message be the message that's actually communicated. That is achieving this depends both on what you say, so that's the the words, the verbal, and how you say it. That's the nonverbal. That would be like gestures, uh, facial expressions, your uh, posture, so a lot of different nonverbal. One of your jobs as a speaker is to make sure that your nonverbal message does not distract from your verbal message. So if you're slumping on the podium, or if you have a PowerPoint and your head's turned away from the audience because you're busy looking at the PowerPoint, taking really long pauses to think of what you have to say next. There's a lot of different nonverbal that can distract. So the audience might be focused more on what you're doing versus what you're actually saying. Then you have the channel. So that's the actual means by which your message is being communicated. Um, if you're on the phone, then it's the phone. If you're on the radio, it's the radio, TV, or in person, then that's gonna be your voice. Then you have the listener. That's the person who um, is actually receiving your message. But what you want to think about as a speaker is everything that you say is filtered through the audience's frame of reference. A frame of reference is kind of like a filter. It's a map and it's made up of everything of that person's knowledge, their experiences, their goals, their values, um, and their attitudes. So we know that everybody has different knowledge um, or experiences. So what you want to think about is what you say is going to be filtered differently for each person. One person might understand it one way, another person might understand it a different way. So just be aware that different people have different ways of filtering, mapping out what you're saying or what your message is based on their previous knowledge or experience and so on. So to be an effective speaker, you have to be audience centered, thinking about the audience, kind of going back to that prior point, um, thinking about what they might already know, um, what they might already feel towards that specific topic and adjusting your speech or just being prepared when you're uh, making your speech of who's my audience, what are they already feeling about this topic? That way you know that when you're delivering your speech, it's going to be a lot more effective to line up with their values. Um, and when you make a speech that causes listeners to say, that is important to me, then you'll know that you're almost always going to be successful. So make sure that you are choosing topics um, that you're very passionate about, and then it's going to naturally come across and other people will see this um, this passion that you have and kind of, you know, it's, it will go on to them too and say, man, I really understand this and this is important to me as well. So the feedback, uh, that's the message nonverbal sent from listener to a speaker. So once again, if they're yawning, then you can tell they're bored. Um, 
if they're looking at their clock or their watch, they might be in a hurry to go somewhere. If they're nodding or smiling or agreeing with you, um, obviously they're you know, really interested in what you have to say. So that's the feedback that the audience is giving to you. Interference is basically anything that impedes with the communication of the message. It can either be external or internal. External uh, examples of that would be maybe y'all have the windows up in the room and you can hear traffic going or maybe there's students talking really loud um, in the hallway. So anything that might distract your audience from hearing you would be external interference. Internal interference, you really don't have much control over that. Um, let's say it's right before lunchtime. So you have a lot of people in your audience that are hungry or maybe the AC is working when it's too cold or too hot, then people are focused more on how they're feeling like, oh my goodness, I'm so cold and I forgot my jacket or it's so hot in here. So that's internal noise. It's something that's going on in their head that's distracting them from listening to your message. Then you have the situation. That's the actual time and place in which speech communication is occurring. So it's a big auditorium or it's a small classroom. Are you indoors or outdoors when you're doing your speech? Is it early in the morning or lunchtime when everyone's hungry? Uh, is it in the evening when people are already kind of getting tired? So you need to be prepared to adjust your speech depending on what your situation is. If you know that it's gonna be um, right before lunchtime, then you might have to skip a few um, points in your speech so that way people are able to you have their attention and shorten it up because they're hungry and ready to go. So you need to adjust it for that situation. And if you go on chapter one, page 21, um, there's more information on how to adjust to a situation depending on those different factors. So another thing that you want to keep in mind is public speaking in a multicultural world. U.S. is called the melting pot for a reason. We have so many people here from um, different countries, different cultures. So it's really important that you um, keep that in mind when you're presenting. If you're planning on maybe pursuing a career in international business, it will be important to keep that in mind. Or maybe even just moving or living or working in a different country uh, in the future. So why is multiculturalism a concept that you wanna keep in mind when you're speaking in public? Let's talk about cultural diversity. You want to understand that meanings are attached to gestures, facial expressions, and other nonverbal uh, signals that vary from one culture to another. There's an example on when you're not aware of this and how that can go wrong. So just like a very, very, very summarized uh, version of that is where somebody in the business is presenting, I believe, to a Brazilian company. The speech goes awesome, um, you know, lots of applause. I think they're trying to persuade them to um, do a contract or something like that. So at the end of the speech, the presenter gives the American sign for OK. However, in Brazil, the sign of OK is basically giving them the finger. So that's the point where they lost the business, the company in Brazil decided to go with somebody else. Had they been aware of these different cultural meanings or diff uh, for them, um, it could have you know, been a completely different scenario. An example would also be presenting the problem on teen drinking in America to German audience. So here in America, we see uh, you know, 21 uh, as the age of legal drinking, anything younger than that, uh, you know, is problematic. However, if you were presenting this or some type of persuasive speech to a German audience, they would not be in agreement with you because in Germany, the actual legal drinking age for beer and wine is 16. For hard liquor, it's 18. Germany society thinks how about they start drinking, you know, as long as it's, you know, with a parent. Um, so it's, it's not just on their own, but um, let them drink under a watchful eye. Let them get that out of their system. So that way, as they're older, 
they're not, you know, having a problem with drinking and alcoholism and so on. And it's worked for the culture. So uh, if somebody's presenting to a German audience saying, hey, this is wrong, kids shouldn't drink, then you're probably gonna have lots of head nods and, you know, or maybe even feel insulted because that's not their way of thinking. So just always being aware, researching what your topic is and who your audience is and what type of ideas or values or feelings they already have over this topic. Um, another thing you want to keep in mind are the different translations for words. So think about what your words are and if they're to be translated, what that would be. Uh, a fail example of this would be with Pepsi. So their slogan was come alive with Pepsi and it had been translated in Taiwan, but the literal translation that it came to was Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. So obviously not very great advertising. Somebody didn't do their homework and you know, was a big fail. So ethnocentrism is a belief that our own group or culture is superior to all other groups or cultures. We want to be aware that all people have their special beliefs and customs. When working on speeches, be alert to how cultural factors might affect how listeners respond. So you want to avoid ethnocentrism. When you're listening to speeches, you want to avoid judging the speaker based on maybe their appearance, if they look different from you, or their manner of delivery, if they're from a different background, if they have um, an accent, uh, you know, you want to avoid judging them based on this. When you are a public speaker, you don't want other people judging you based on how you look or how you sound. And when you're an audience listening to somebody, you want to focus on what do they have to say? Are they supporting that with facts using those critical speaking skills, um, critical thinking skills? And then at the end, you can make your decision whether you agree or disagree, but not based on physical appearance or how they sound. So that is chapter one. If y'all have any questions, please send me an email and um, I'll see y'all for the next chapter.